Hey guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we have Gary Norden to talk about the evolution of professional institutional trading. Gary's a 25-year trading veteran, and I want to uh, give him a special thanks for waking up at 6.30 in the morning from down under in Australia in order to do this presentation. Uh, some of the bullet points that he wants to cover today include a timeline from the 1980s to present day and a glimpse at the future, uh, deregulation of the marketplace, banks and market makers, floor traders, trading desks, position traders, hedge funds, prop shops, risk management systems, the evolution of educational requirements, derivatives and new products, data analysis and mathematical analysis, and a summary and lessons to be learned. Keep in mind, all of these topics are uh, geared towards the evolution of professional institutional trading. So it's a, it's a lot of topics, it's kind of broad, but he's gonna narrow the focus to that area. Gary's asked that as you guys have questions, uh, he would like to hold them until the end of the webinar, so please keep that in mind. The, record, the uh, webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel sometime tomorrow. If you're watching the recording at a later date and you like it, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up. It does help us out. Okay. With that, I'm going to give control to Gary right now and get us started. All right, Gary, you should have the option to share the screen again. Hi there. Um, thanks to Big Mike Trading for allowing me on today and also to Peter Davis from Jigsaw Trading who uh, asked me to, to do the presentation as well. Uh, just to correct the record, because I'm in Western Australia, it's actually 4.30 in the morning, so if I sound oh. a bit croaky, <laughs> that's the reason why, but uh, yeah. hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy the, uh, the the presentation nonetheless. Right. Um, Thank you very so much, I'll Gary. head off into it, and, and no, no worries. Uh, firstly, under Australian law, which I work under, here's a, a disclaimer which I have to show, and having all read that intently, we'll move on. Uh, uh, quickly, I'll just spend uh, literally two minutes to, to, to explain a bit about myself, my, my background. I'm originally from London, uh, which is a small town in the south uh, southeast of England. Uh, I started trading for an investment bank at eight, when I was 18 years old. Um, just six months after leaving school, I was given a job as a trader. Uh, trading equity derivatives, so thrown straight in at the deep end, trading uh, Japanese equity derivatives just around the time of the crash of the Nikkei, 1990. Um, I spent 14 years trading in London, roughly half of that was spent um, uh, as a, a local options market maker on the life floor, the futures exchange. Uh, other positions for investment banks, I was head of options for NatWest, who were the largest bank in England at the time. Uh, I traded also a proprietary convertible bond uh, book for ING. At pretty much every bank that I worked at, uh, I was involved in the training of traders and sales staff at those banks. When the f life floor closed down 1990-2000, um, I moved on to trading futures rather than options and, and doing that electronically. I moved here to, uh, to Australia in 2003 just for a lifestyle change really um, and I consult um, to both professional and, and retail firms and traders, investment banks, exchanges, all the different sorts of people. Um, I published two books. Um, and to the ball was the most recent one um, from Wiley, and then the first one, Technical Analysis and the Active Trader, was a, a, a real look at technical analysis and, and, and does it work. And on the left-hand side there was my mnemonic on the trading floor. Um, just to, for those who are not aware of mnemonics, we trade with each other using our mnemonics. The white circle means that I was an options trader. The green uh, shading of the square behind it. Um, it means I had a scratch trade facility which was offered to locals, so that shows that I was a local trader trading for myself. So let's get into um, discussing the evolution of, of trading within within the professional industry. Um, so the late 1980s, I think, is where I'll, I'll kick things off because I wasn't around before then. Obviously, they've been trading on, on trading floors prior to that. From the late 1980s, what we saw was a deregulation of markets um, globally. Um, in London, it was called the Big Bang. Um, and you saw huge increases to, to, to volumes of products, and suddenly people who didn't previously have access to, to markets had them. 
Um, new markets were developing very quickly. Uh, derivatives, futures, and warrants, options, these were moving forward very quickly by the late 80s. Um, but computerization was still in its early days, even though we were trading on computers sometimes. Uh, and the first market I traded was actually was a phone-based market, not computer-based. Um, still in its early days. So traders at the banks often needed to trade and to track their own positions. Um, and certainly the, the speed of trading in those days was so fast that you often didn't have time to, to, to update your positions in the computer system that quickly. It really was that quick. Um, and we used to have to manage. I used to have a huge big pad and just used to just write down all my trades. And, and there would be hundreds of trades a day. Um, so obviously a lot of scope to, to make mistakes in that as well. Um, so this type of environment required fast um, thinking um, traders and, and typically they were very young um, and, and so I was 18, I was the youngest but you know, I wasn't the youngest by many, many years. There were 19, 20 year old traders in my market um, and it was ca categorized by young traders um, and you needed to be fast um, as much as anything else. You needed to be aggressive, um, that's another thing about that time I think. Um, everyone was taking each other on, uh, markets were quite adversarial, so again coming back to the markets that I was involved in, um, the various market making houses we traded against each other as well as trading against funds and, and, and the general market itself and the movement of, of, of the products. And we had to trade heavily, so as I say we would trade hundreds of times a day and that was, you know, it's very common for, for professional traders of that, of that time, um, trading aggressively. So it really suited quick thinking, sort of street smart traders rather than analytical ones. You didn't have the time to sit there and analyze things. The prices of products was moving around, were moving around very, very quickly. Um, and you just needed to be able to deal with that and, and, and get on with it. Um, around that time as well, it's important to understand that the structure of, of, of banks was different. Um, we've seen a lot of consolidation, which I'll go through a, a bit later, but in those days, um, there was more specialization of, of, of different banks. Um, most banks and, and participants were, were, were market makers only, um, just looking to, to be market makers and make money from, from making prices and just fulfilling that niche in the marketplace, uh, making prices to other institutions or, or funds, that, that kind of um, set up. Um, there are a few specialized, you know, what we used to call trading houses. So, Firms that, that specialised in trading and, and, and taking on more risk than a market maker would, and Salomon Brothers, <coughs> excuse me, probably one of the most famous of those um, of, of the institutions that, that took um, that took risk and, and, and decided to be you know a trading uh, company. They did make markets as well, Salomon, um, but their, their strong reputation was in was in um, taking risk and, and, and taking trades. And obviously, it's ultimately Salomon Brothers was gobbled up by Smith Barney and Citigroup. The traders, uh, those sorts of places, tended to be a bit older. I mean, I suppose if, if I was 18, everybody was older. Um, but they tended to be more experienced traders, more structured to those trading desks than we had. Uh, I can tell you that a, a trading desk like ours, whether it was, you know, we were trading Japanese warrants or whether it was UK equities or those sorts of desks, and I had friends on all those desks, um, they were just completely, it was almost complete madness from the start of trading. There was just so much going on. Um, and there was more structure to, to, to these other trading desks, these other trading houses. Um, so I'd like to note that there was a, a separation really of, of trading houses really to um, the, the market makers, the flow traders, they were seen as different. Um, so trading desks were chaotic, um, risk management was poor, well, I can tell you risk management was non-existent frankly um, on, on a number of desks including the one that I traded and you know we were trading millions if not tens of millions of dollars worth of, of warrants every day um, in terms of understanding what the real risk of that was, it, it didn't exist. But saying that, it, it wasn't a huge issue because our job was to be a market maker and that was the same of, of many of us. So those of us that were trading in that way, lots of trades, fast markets, we our, our main job was to make prices and we had to learn to understand markets and understand how to make prices. So that was what we were paid to do, be able to make prices, change prices as the market moved and be quick. Um, we didn't carry huge amounts of positions. 
and particularly when the market in, in, in my market in Japan started to unravel, you, you just you couldn't hold positions. It was too volatile. So our job was to make was to be a market maker. So risk management wasn't as, as severe. Yes, there are bad losing days, but as I'll discuss in a minute, there are there's been worse trading days for most S since risk management has supposedly improved. So if we go back to, to this market I was in, it was the glamour market of, of London at the time, the Japanese warrant market. It was the market that every trader wanted to be in um, up until the point that I joined because Japan was the biggest bull market. This market was incredibly, um, uh, it was fast, the traders were well paid, it, uh, it was just incredible. And people, were, even in our own bank, and, and this was true across lots of banks, would actually come and watch us during the day. It was, sometimes we felt like being in a zoo. People would watch us. We would be on our feet, screaming and shouting at each other. It was a phone-based market, so we would pick up the phone and have to relay prices to other market makers on the desk. And when the market was opened, this would be happening thousands of times a day. It was absolutely incredible. Nowadays, you'd, it would be unthinkable that uh, an 18-year-old who was six months out of school would be given that, that opportunity. Um, hey, Gary, sorry for no interrupting. Training. No one taught me to trade. I just want to verify what's. No. Sorry for yes. interrupting. I want to verify what slide you're on right now to make sure my recording is working. The one that I'm seeing is is late '80s. Uh, late '80s, yep. Okay, just making sure. Sorry, thank you. Cool. Um, so there was no training. No one, no one taught me to trade. Uh, no one really taught me even about how to make a price. Um, let, let alone. What is a warrant? Um, all these things I had to go away and learn myself, um, and that was pretty typical. You were you were thrown in at the deep end, and then it was sink or swim. And that was the case for I had friends in other in other markets and in, in, in uh, other other banks in in London, and it was pretty similar. Um, the idea of a six month training program, learning everything that didn't exist back then. You really learn on the job, um, and if you, if you succeeded, you did. And if you didn't, you, you were gone. Um, traders often in those days came from back office positions, not just traders, but our um, assistants as well. So um, it was often thought that if you've got experience in the back office, settling trades and looking at positions, um, that was a good in to coming onto the trading desk. So often the back office was seen by people as a way of getting onto the into the front office. Excuse me. And so. A lot of people on the desk came from that sort of background. Again, we'll contrast that with nowadays where it happens less. And the success of traders, as I say, was very hit or miss. Um, it was, and in our desk, we had a bunch of guys lost, and then they would just get uh, moved on, and then new guys moved in. So quite chaotic, no structure, and and no risk risk management to note. <clears throat> if you move into the 90s. Um, there's some significant changes. The consolidation of, of banks meant that market making, position taking desks began to intermingle um, and market makers began to become position takers too. Banks therefore um, were starting to take more risk. Banks that previously hadn't taken as much risk. But saying that flow trading or just market making was still the bread and butter, still the mainstay for, for, for most banks. They always recognised that that's where there was, they had their, their real edge. But they did start to take positions on as well. One of the other reasons for the, for the position taking, this next point, risk management systems are now being put into place. So they are now bringing risk managers in, starting their first sort of modelling of, of, of risk. And so banks, uh, institutions started to believe that they understood risk a lot better than they did before. So as they thought that they understood risk, they started to take more risk. Of course, they didn't think they were taking risk because they believed they had it covered by their system. Market makers for banks are predominantly trading against hedge funds or mutual funds and pension funds. And I want to make that point, not against retail traders. We, we, we don't trade against retail traders in those days. We predominantly trade against other professionals. And in my mind, it made it more interesting, more more fun, and more challenging. Um, but we didn't take on retail traders. Also, into the 90s, um, traders' salaries, um, bonuses started to increase um, quite substantially. Um, and this is where you start to see 
um, people earning in, into the millions rather than just earning perhaps you know a, a couple hundred thousand or something and in, in those days that, that is significant money. Moving forward here, it's also into the 90s, um, there's now an increasing focus uh, on, uh, I, I should put intelligence in inverted commas but I didn't, on intelligence when selecting new traders and it, the other key word there is selecting. Um, traders are now being selected before they get put onto a desk. So the idea of just bringing back office people through, not so much. Um, and now banks are starting to look a lot more at um, who are we putting onto these positions. Um, so basically pretty much every trader coming onto a bank desk is going to be a graduate um, and they'll now be subject to a selection process and testing. Um, not to the degree that we know now but into the 90s this has just started um, to, to try and I suppose isolate who they think are going to be the, the better traders most suited to that environment. Graduate training programs are now being introduced into banks in the 90s um, and they're pretty comprehensive to, to be fair. Um, they taught new employees pretty much all the workings and processes of, of the bank so you, you weren't just taught about your trading desk, um, you were taught about many different aspects because the bank realises perhaps that the trader wouldn't work out and they'd have to move them on to somewhere else. Um, each area importantly was taught or delivered by someone from that section of the bank so if you were learning about settlement procedures, the settlement processes, um, you would be taught by someone from settlement so even a, a trainee trader wouldn't be just taught by a, a trader on the desk, he learned each particular area from a specialist, a risk manager would teach him or her about the risk management system and that's where I started to get involved as well as trading um, I would do some of the training for traders about subjects, sometimes about options, so I used to teach options, um, but also about market making, how to make a price and, and, and how to start looking at markets from the perspective of price making. So graduates are now getting uh, a really good program um, of, of training and learning which we didn't get um, five or ten years before. Initially, these new risk processes, the risk managers that they put in place, these intelligent traders that they now had, led uh, banks uh, to be, over, in my opinion, overconfident. They were certainly very confident, in my opinion, overconfident, and we saw some big losses. And some of those losses are reported, some of them are not. That's the way the industry is, so you won't have heard of all of them, but there were a number of, of big losses as banks thought that they understood risk, but they only understood the, the, the basics of it really. In my experience, what was quite important around this time was that there were still many of what I would call these street savvy traders, the traders from the, the mid to late 80s who had been around before the risk management models who had to manage their own positions, track them, manage their own risk. Um, they were fiercely competitive people and that stopped them from taking too much risk as well because they just wanted to win. Because the markets back in the mid to late 80s were so adversarial, we all knew who we were trading against, who was better than who and, and, and who was getting the upper hand and, and that competition meant that you didn't want to lose. You didn't want to lose to the next person and, and and so those guys grew up in a different environment. Um, they fiercely protected their P&L, fiercely protected, and, and were, were, were staunch competitors. Um, and there were still many of these around um, in the banks in the 90s, and often in, in more senior positions of banks. And they were able, hopefully, sometimes to control um, what did become quite trigger happy. Um, of these new breed of, of the more intelligent traders, the traders who have got the the, the, the academic backgrounds, uh, gone through the training process, understood the risk management models, but in my opinion there was still something lacking about them um, and the street savvy traders were still around um, to try and protect the bank um, and instill some good trading techniques on them. No matter how smart you are, you have to learn how does this market work and, and particularly when you're a price maker. Um, that's so important. 
So through this presentation, I thought I'd give a few anecdotes uh, of my time uh, within the banks in particular to sort of give a flavour of the type of people that you come across. Um, so in the early mid-90s, I, I, as I said, I was head of an options um, team for a big UK bank, the largest UK bank, and that our bank had recently um, taken on um, a global prop trader from Salomon. So I mentioned that Salomon were the biggest trading house and they had the biggest trading reputations in the markets. Those of you, most of you will probably be aware of uh, LTCM um, and the fact that those guys um, mostly originally came from um, Salomon Brothers and, and the guys that we had uh, were um, counterparts, or peers of those at, L, uh, at Salomon. Um, so that definitely didn't break Break up, but people moved into different places, and and our bank poached at quite high salaries uh, a couple of these traders, um, big name traders in the market, and then they were supposedly you know a, a big coup for us to have. I got to know the uh, one of these prop traders pretty well, um, and that was because I, within the bank I was promoting um, some option trades um, that he and a number of others continually liked to tell me. Um, that I was wrong, basically, and that they were on the other side. I knew that um, it was the early days of LTCM, but I knew that they were on the other side of the trade. Salomon Brothers, uh, those sorts of guys were telling me quite convinced I was wrong. Um, and how could someone who started trading at 18 and didn't go to university, you know, how could you take these guys on? You're definitely wrong. I got to know him a lot in, in, during that process of, of being told that I'm wrong um, and how smart all these guys were and how good they were. Um, it did turn out within a f about six months that, that, that they were wrong um, and they happily and kindly donated uh, quite a lot of money to our bank um, through being wrong. What I started to realize was that you know this star trader and these, these so-called market stars, they weren't half as good as, as their reputation had said um, and the reality was they weren't doing well, they were losing quite a lot of money at our bank. And during this time, I went out with I went out to dinner with a, a trader um, who had worked alongside them for a short while at our bank. He came in, he you know, who offered the chance to work with these superstar traders. Thought, what a great opportunity! Went to work with them for a few months, and 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 then moved off the desk when he realised that they probably weren't as good as he thought, or they weren't as good as he thought. And and I went out to dinner with him, and and one comment that that got me, and it's stayed with me ever since. He, he turned around to me at one point and said, Gary, we've got this all wrong, me and you. Uh, we're trading the markets and, and these guys are trading their careers. And, and that comment stayed with me and I think it's very valid for uh, a number of people around. Um, not just traders, but there's a number of people who are just trading their careers. Um, they get themselves in, they become big traders in markets or big names through whatever contacts it could be in the media nowadays. And then um, they just move themselves around really well. Because of the increase in pay, golden handshakes in those days, you'd join that bank and they'd give you a, a lump sum to start with. These traders have learned that business really well, building false reputations, making large sums for themselves, but probably not making too much money for their banks. It, it really was a, a big eye opener for me um, into understanding um, how people were working and, and that not to trust everything I saw out there and not to trust everything I hear out there. As an aside as well, um, partly linked to that, what I just said but also separately a little bit different, rogue traders, we've obviously heard the term over the years. I, I've worked at four investment banks, um, and uh, three reasonably large ones, one medium. Two of them definitely had rogue traders. One was made public, it was quite famous. Um, I knew him well and I can say I did not know he was rogue at the time, I had absolutely no idea. Um, the other one was never made public, even within the bank it was hushed up. Another bank had a trader that, that I suspect was a rogue trader, I've never found out. Again, if, if he was, it was kept in house, I suspect from the way he was trading. And the, 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 yeah, the things that I saw him do, I, I was very cautious of him. 
And then uh, another bank, the, the other one, uh, had someone who was undoubtedly just trading his career. And in many ways, the way that they operate mirrors a rogue trader. Um, they, they, they're disruptive. Um, and they, they generally lose money because they're really not concentrating as much on their trading. And the people that I found, I found that are trading their careers are not good traders. They're just simply not good traders. That's, that's why they trade their career. And to be quite frank, most of them are very, very good at trading their career. They're excellent at it. So unfortunately, I'd say this issue is a little bit more widespread than than we'd like it to be. I'm someone who um, believes passionately in the integrity of markets and professionalism, um, and, and I hate seeing that kind of thing go on. I believe there's less chance of this happening if traders themselves have more skin in the game, and I think this is a problem at, at banks, that traders don't have enough skin in the game. Um, and I have un encountered traders in investment banks who take the view that they'll, they'll um, take big trades, they'll punt large, if it comes off they'll get big bonuses and if it doesn't they'll get a job somewhere else. I have encountered that and um, it's not what it's obviously not what this business is supposed to be about. So floor traders for example, they've obviously got good skin in the game, it's their own money, so they've obviously less chance of that kind of thing happening. So that's an intro into floor traders, so as I said I spent a number of years as a pit trader an options market maker on the, the London Futures Exchange. Um, and so running alongside what was happening at, at the institutions, at the, the investment banks during the 80s and 90s, we had the evolution of, of the futures and options floor traders. And most of the, the, the um, pit trading environments, whether it's the CME, Board of Trade or, or Life, um, the numbers of traders was growing hugely. I mean, life grew from just a, you know, a couple of hundred people in the, the late 80s to I think it was about three or 4,000 um, when I was down there at the time, so massive growth. But again, if we look at these traders, and, and that's what I want to do today, is look at the different traders and how they've evolved and, and what did, you know, who are the successful ones and, and what do they do. If you look at the pit traders, whether they were offshore market makers or futures traders in the pits, they didn't use computers. They didn't have the risk management models. Yes, they're, they're, they're clear as did, but it wasn't an issue because they're really just in and out of a couple of lots at a time. So product controllers weren't needed. They knew what they were good at and they kept to it, which is generally just scalping in and out in, in small amounts and, and, and knowing how to make prices and, and act in a market maker type role. And interestingly, their tools didn't change much during that period. They were armed with a pencil and a, and a trading card. That's what they had. They looked at the screens around them to find out what was happening in markets. They looked and heard about what was happening in the pit around them. They used that to trade with. Um, they didn't evolve as, as much as the banks were. But saying that, in, in terms of their performance, they generally outperformed the banks. And for example, I was uh, approached to take over the, 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 the options desk for that bank because I was a local. They wanted locals. And that, the same thing happened. Salomon did the same with their floor team. They took a local to head theirs. So did Goldman's, JP Morgan. All the banks wanted locals to run their desks because they kept thinking, well, these are the guys that are really making money and they're better than our guys. What are they doing? How can a guy sitting with a piece of paper and a pencil make better markets, make better trades than our guys sitting, up, sitting upstairs. And certainly when we went into the banks upstairs and we got to know the traders, we did find that, that we, we were um, more knowledgeable about many aspects of, of trading. So floor traders learned market maker type techniques, how to make prices, knowing when to trade, when not to trade. Remembering that they, they, they traded a lot, they, they seemed to be aggressive traders. You might trade 20, 30, 50, 100 times a day depending on, on who you were. But that still only means you're actually in the market for a very short period of the trading day. So you trade a lot but you hold positions quite quickly. Um, and they mostly stuck to that. There were a few guys that, that traded longer term and certainly in terms of options, market making, we had to keep positions because we were you know, making prices in a range of options. But you know what we tried to do was just to get in and out of trades quickly. And I wanted to use this quote. I was sent an email recently, um, some reminiscences of a, of a former floor trader from Chicago, 
and um, I thought this quote, to me, it, it, it sums up a lot about what a professional trader needs to be. He said, and I quote, by necessity, I quickly made the transition from what I had always thought was a trader to a market maker. And I think to me that encapsulates what a real professional trader is about. Um, it's not always about punting and trying to guess the market direction. It, it, it should be for a professional about learning to make a price, understanding what goes into that. And if you can do that, you can understand a lot more about trading and to trade in and out quickly of other people's business. Um, in order to do that, these floor traders, they learned how to understand the market, to understand how they worked. And importantly for, for any trader, they learned to trade them as they were. So to trade the markets as they were, not to use any subjective assumptions. Um, obviously in a pit with a pencil and a paper and, and just some, some um, quote boards around the, the sides of the pit, they didn't, for example, have access to charts. They couldn't look at a one minute, two minute graph or trend lines. They, they didn't have any of that. And, and, and if you know anything about me, you'll know that I am very uh, skeptical of, of technical analysis and charting. Remember, these guys didn't have that. Um, they couldn't use subjective analysis and, and traders shouldn't. We should be very objective. We should be able to look at what's happening just from the basis of this is happening, not from a perspective of it's happening because or to try and put it into some kind of a trend or anything, just to trade what you see. Um, they were able to do that really because they didn't have anything else to do. They didn't have any of this stuff in front of them. Floor traders were dedicated to training new traders. Pretty much you know, every local that I knew was, was trying to train someone up. Um, which I, I find was was was, was fantastic. Um, they would take an assistant, um, and and normally the, the assistants uh, would be young young people because they were cheap, um, not necessarily um, uh, university graduates. Maybe if that options they were, they again took the hungry street smart young people. Um, as their, their runners, we called them our runners, the people that run around doing things for us. Um, and, and we spent time training them up. We would spend months training them until they were ready. Um, and then when they were ready, the trader would, would back that new young trader. So he'd provide the capital for them to trade. So they had skin in the game because they backed that trader. And this was how you know the, the flaws evolved and how they got more and more people. Yes, there are new people coming into the pits, but also the existing traders are training up new traders. And in my experience, the way that they trained them, the types of people they took, um, and also the fact they had skin in the game meant that their training was better than what was going on at the banks. And the traders they produced, in, in many cases, I think were better traders and their knowledge was better. Other um, bonuses of, of, of the trading floors, they had traders from all around the world, so I was in London, but we had a number of people coming over from the US, from Chicago, from all parts of the world to trade in London. So there were excellent places, excellent learning centers. You could chat with traders from all around the world, see them firsthand. You hear a lot about traders, but the thing about the floor is you can actually see people firsthand and how they react, how they, how they trade, and people, nothing was really a secret. Excuse me, people would, would explain to you basically what they're doing, you know, and um, knowing that we were all different anyway, so it wasn't that some, someone was going to take what you said and exactly copy it. So I found the floor an excellent place to, to learn as much as anything else, and I treated it as a learning exercise all the way through. Uh, I believe the success rate of, of future traders on that floor was higher than particularly the retail futures industry, um, but that wouldn't be hard really, let's face it. Um, and in all the years that I spent in this industry, and it, it's the only industry I've ever been in, um, the best traders I've ever worked with were all floor traders. In particular, the option market makers, I, I think, were exceptional. Their speed, their, their knowledge, their intelligence, their ability to make a price was exceptional. And I, I, I'm not um, scared to say or you know, um, that I found floor trading far harder than trading in a bank. I'd say quite honestly that um, floor trading was not my best time. I was down there for seven years. It wasn't my best time. I learned a lot though, and I learned a lot that's helped me ever since. Um, but some of it, my strengths weren't suited to floor trading, and 
people suited to floor trading were, were generally slightly different in character. Um, but saying that, I say I enjoyed it and I learned a lot. But the competition was was far stiffer than any I found at any investment bank. I found when I've gone into a bank, I've generally you know done very very well at banks quite comfortably, but on the floor it's far more competition and far better traders. So as you move into the, the, the 2000s, <clears throat> um, product controllers now uh, added alongside risk managers. For those of you not aware of that um, term, a product controller really is someone looking at liquidity. Um, they do analysis, whether it's weekly or monthly, depends on the bank, of you know, you've got a position of let's say five million dollars of a bond, for example, and they're looking at the fact of well, you know, if you wanted to get out of this, you can only get out of two million. So we've got to adjust the price you've got that. So they look more at liquidity issues. Um, to a fair degree, they're they're, they're more trouble than a risk manager is to a trader, um, partly because their knowledge of trading isn't that high. So sometimes you have these conversations of trying to get things through that they they misread. But they've been added to risk managers, another layer of 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 person looking over a trading book um, in the in the effort to strengthen the risk analysis. By the 2000s, the the VAR model was adopted by most banks. Again, if, I'm not sure if you're aware of that value at risk model. Um, most banks adopted that as their as at least the basis of their risk management. Um, I won't go into the VAR model except to say that there are some significant deficiencies with it. Um, but hey, it's a model, so you know the bank's got to love it, right? Um, again, more focus again on derivatives, creating new products. Almost a belief that if you can create a product, you've got some sort of uh, edge over everybody else, and if you can get other people to trade your product, then that helps. Um, Prop trading, so this is um, the idea that the banks actually are taking positions um, rather than just being a market maker. That basically has gone in waves. Um, sometimes it's popular, uh, banks will take on prop traders and take risk, then they get hit with large losses, so they cut the prop traders. Then you know, a few years later they have another go at it and, and that's gone around in waves. I'm not quite sure which wave we're on right now, but we've, we've done it at least four or five times along most investment banks. Uh, riding that particular wave, um, which you know, as I'll allude to in a second, it's interesting because if you think that um, all these guys are in there, the product controllers and the risk managers, then you'd think that these large losses wouldn't be happening. But of course, they continue. Selection process for traders is even more rigorous than ever. Um, we now have it's not just good enough now to be a, a, a graduate. Now a lot of this now want PhDs. Um, they're far more selective of the subjects as well. I mean, if we go back to early 2000s, you could have a degree in geography, and if you pass the tests, okay, um, you could still become a trader. Um, now that's getting more difficult, and they particularly want you know the, the math, uh, physics-based um, people. Not every bank, but um, it, you know this is the way it's been moving. In terms of the graduate training programs, they continue really in a, in a pretty similar fashion. A uh, similar vein, so they're, they're well-rounded. They're, they're good programs. You'll learn a lot about everything. Um, I can probably speak for for most young traders when I say that I'm sure that they fall asleep when they're having discussions about certain sections of the bank where they've really got no interest in. But they will learn a lot, and and I always when I'm when a bank encourage everyone to learn about everything. One of the points about trading is again not picked up by a lot of particularly retail traders is. You can find edge and knowledge from so many different areas of this business. Even an understanding of settlement can sometimes help. Um, so I tell traders to learn about it, understand that process, things like stock borrow. Um, these things can give you edge if you understand them uh, well. So I do encourage people to learn as much as they can. And so I think those programs are pretty good, to be fair. By the 2000s, and certainly as we get towards you know this today, um, the number of those older sort of street savvy type traders uh, has diminished. They're generally left um, they're similar ages to me, um, so they've they've probably you know had enough, um, done what they need to do. So now trading desks are pretty much um, only the quant style um, intelligent smarter traders. 
Large losses continue at banks from time to time, despite or perhaps because of the new super smart traders and their superior risk management. Perhaps there's an overconfidence, or not perhaps, there can be an overconfidence in banks. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand and I've seen it secondhand. Overconfidence leads to um, poor positions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'll give an anecdote here. Um, Pierre is not his name, but it might allude you to where he comes from in the world. Pierre was on a, a, a an investment bank desk. Um, he was an exceptionally intelligent person. One of these um, that, is a, at a very young age, we're talking below the age of ten, he was um, almost a, a concert standard pianist. Um, uh, extremely intelligent at school. Was, you know, um, had a PhD was brought onto the trading desk um, as an analyst. Um, all through, and this is just my right. You know, at age two, what's five plus five? Pierre, he'd got ten. He's right, and all through his life, in his maths and everything he'd done, he'd been correct. So, when he had a view, uh, and he was a convertible bond trader, so when he had a view of a bond, and he would say, "I think this is cheap," and if that obviously, if it was cheap, the market didn't think it was such a good bond because if, it, if the market thought that, it wouldn't be so cheap. His view was, and this is what he'd been led to believe all his life, is he's right. Um, so he would buy these bonds, and then, you know, some of us would be arguing that well, there must be a reason why it's wrong. I have the view that if something looks particularly mispriced or too cheap, there's probably a reason for it. Um, there's too many smart people around for that not to be the case. But he said, "No, nah, I'm right on this one," and he was what? Well, not usually, he was always wrong. And worse, he found it hard to admit he was wrong because his whole life he'd been right. He was very good at I mean, his maths, everything, he, the way he analyzed his quants, his analysis of, of bonds, exceptional if, if you're not a trader. He had incredible ability to analyze a bond. But there's a subtlety missing in that that is important if you want to be a successful trader. And that ability to ask, why might this be wrong? Why might this be cheap? What could be happening? And often uh, a, a, a good trader could tell him that. And I thought at this point I'll, I'll um, just another sort of uh, anecdote, or just to, to quote it. This is from the book *The Black Swan* by by Nassim Taleb. I'm a big fan of Taleb, and I love this book. And he relates a story. Um, he has two fictional characters: Dr. John versus Fat Tony. Um, <clears throat> Dr. John being the quant style trader, Fat Tony being the street, star, street smart type of bloke, and there's been 99 fair coin tosses, all of them come up heads, and they're asked, what are the odds of a tail on the 100th toss? And Dr. John, the quant guy, says 50%, whereas Fat Tony says, it ain't a fair toss. And I 100% concur with that kind of a, of a thought. Dr. John, the, the quant guy, has an inability to think outside the box from what he's been taught. Of course, 99 heads might be random. It might be random. Um, but does your thinking enable you to think that it might not be? How do you go about proving that? How do you go about finding that? That, to me, is what separates the, the good traders from the others.
an incredibly intelligent bloke. This model we had was the best of its kind in the world. Uh, it was phenomenal. He could build anything and anything we wanted. He also one day said, I want to become a trader. Personally, I thought he would be a waste. He was fantastic at what he did. I didn't. I, I wouldn't have moved him because we, we lost in terms of our IT. He moved on to become a trader. Incredible um, quant skills, incredible skills to, to, to delve into the math behind what's happening with these bonds. He also never made any money. Um, even bank traders today, and I'm, and I'm being told this not just from my own experience, but from other people who are feeding back to me and people that I'm engaged with at uh, banks and elsewhere, um, often have little knowledge of the basics of how to trade, how to trade around a position, how to make prices, these kind of things, which, which previously were, were just you know the, the basic knowledge for us. This is diminishing um, in investment banks as well. Um, and in my opinion, it's one reason why so many startup hedge funds fail. The guys have been in a bank, some of them may have made money for a short period of time, they go on and set up their hedge funds, but the reality is a lot of these guys don't actually have the basic knowledge that is needed of a trader. Hey Gary, I apologize for interrupting. Go to webinar, stopped sharing your screen. Can you take a look and um, make sure that it's showing that it's shared on your side? It is. Okay, I, I don't have it, and my side's the recording, so do me a favor for just one moment and pause recording and then start it again. I just want to make sure the recording for this is going to work. Or I'm not, sorry, not recording. Pause the sharing and then start again. Ah. Stop sharing. Yeah, everybody else in the chat says it's work, working for them, but since it's not working for me, I'm afraid that the recording is going to be messed up. Okay. Oh no, what's happened there? Have you got it? Uh, no. Okay, sorry. It tells me that it's showing. Yeah, I mean, everybody else can definitely see it. I don't know why I can't, but it just means that the uh, the recording's going to miss it. Uh, sorry, give me, I'm going to take control for just one second um, and then give it back to you to see if it solves the problem, okay? Because I just want the recording to work. Okay. All right, so everybody should see my screen, yes? Guys, are you seeing my screen? No. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, Gary, on the GoToWebinar panel, there's, an, there's a button that says Change Presenter. Change it to me, please. Yeah, I realize the people that are in the room right now can see the screen, but the problem is for the recording for everybody else for years to come. I'm trying to make sure the recording is going to work. So Gary, did you see the button to change presenter to me? Yeah, I did it. Okay. Everybody seeing my screen? Okay. Now I'm going to give you control, Gary. Okay, there we go. It's back. All right, sorry about that, guys. All right, thank you. Please continue, Gary. Okay, no worries. Gave my voice a chance to rest for a second. Um, okay, so moving forward also today, another uh, evolution. So as the banks uh, take more risk um, and, and take more positions and have lost those market-making skills, the people that we see, or the, 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 the places that we see with market making style traders, are now at the CFD uh, stroke uh, FX shops. Um, but interestingly, they're now taking on retail traders rather than hedge funds. Um, so they're using their market making skills, their ability to set prices, um, but taking on retail traders. Frankly, uh, you know, from my 
my belief of uh, being a professional trader, that, that's easy money. It doesn't require a lot of skill to take money off retail traders making prices. But um, that's something that you know didn't exist 10 years ago now. That's where they see it. And, and to be fair, if, I suppose if you want to make money in this business, taking on retail traders is the way to be. Um, interestingly, investment banks nowadays, if you, if you look at the way they, they're operating, they tend to need easy market conditions to make money and they often are losing in turbulent times. If you go back to the GFC, you'll see all these investment banks got absolutely whacked and pretty much all of them did. And so ironically, they're starting to look more and more like a retail trader. They make when markets are good and easy and they lose when it gets tough. That's not what the position they should be. They should be able, if they had decent traders, proper risk management systems and an understanding of markets, understanding of positioning, understanding of risk of hedging, um, they should be able to make money when everyone else is losing as well. Um, they shouldn't get caught so much as they are. They get they were caught at the same time and I think you have to look at the risk management models for that. Uh, and I'll relate that back to this, this loss of background knowledge, the loss of of some basics in there, uh, many of these banks, uh, and um, what I believe is a misguided solely quant math focus, um, and and risk systems that, that frankly don't always capture the risk. Um, at times, um, the risk systems can actually exacerbate the problems. Uh, you, you'll find is if you're trading at a bank that there are certain trades that your risk system just doesn't like, so you can't do them. Does it mean they're bad trades? No, often it's not. Often it's contrarian trades they don't like. And I had that instance at a, at a bank uh, where a contrarian trade blew the VAR model you know, out, out of proportion because it was contrarian. Well, as a trader, you must be able to take contrarian trades. Uh, you must be able to trade against the market positioning because that's where they, the market can get caught out. Example will be what we've seen in the, the German Bund uh, market over the last week where everybody's positioned one way, does your model allow you to have a decent sized position the other way? Uh, if it doesn't, you, you might have a problem. So often traders in banks are getting crowded into the same positions because they're the ones that their risk management models allow them to build in the biggest size and often end up becoming just like trend traders. They go with the trend because the trends perform quite well or perform very well in a lot of those risk management systems. Traders in investment banks are learning to trade the risk system rather than trade the markets. Um, and this is becoming uh, quite a, a large issue in my opinion. Um, risk managers are obviously uh, have a lot of power at the banks, but the traders are realizing that if you want to have, build up a big position and, and become a big trader, you, you've got to do what the, what the risk system says. You can't trade against it. So they end up as much trading the risk system as they are trading the markets. And there is a big problem in my opinion. Um, again, running alongside, so I've discussed floor traders. I thought I'd spend uh, just a, a few minutes on uh, on futures prop shops, which I'm sure is uh, uh, an, an area of discussion uh, around around the site. So these evolved from from floor trading. Um, when the floor ceased trading, people wanted a place to go and trade. Prop shops opened up. Again, if you go back to what I said about the um, Futures traders, options traders, always on the floor, always training new people, putting them through, backing them. That's really the, the essence and the, the, the startup of where these prop shops come from. Um, and initially, excellent success in places like London and elsewhere in Europe. Um, they had good success, the same model. Um, not 100%, not wouldn't expect that. But being trained by the old floor traders in, in some of those traditional basic techniques of, of market making, scalping, understanding how to make a price, understanding markets. Um, and so they built very quickly. I remember a prop shop that um, I was clearing through the same clearer, so I was sat in a, in a private room next door, but um, the prop shop itself went from sort of six traders to 50 in about six months. Did very well. Originally concentrating purely on, on market making style trading, trying to understand how to make a price, scalping quickly. And originally they took the same type of person as floor traders, young, you know, um, guys who, or, and, and, and uh, girls who, who just want to succeed. 
um, there some of the early um, selection processes was more about how quick you were the belief that you've got to be quick to be a, a, a scalper or a futures trader so they wanted people who were going to be quick um, they too now select more on intelligence um, they're looking for certain backgrounds um, and again for me you've got to look at the market if you're trading a market that is fast that is quick that needs that person that can make a decision very quickly is this right or wrong that's not intelligence that's something a bit different that's that street savviness of there's something not quite going right here um, that to me is is more important <clears throat> interestingly many of these shops uh, are now trading more technically they're bringing in um, technical levels um, charting that kind of stuff and um, in, from what I've seen their performance has become more erratic as well remembering that floor traders didn't use this type of analysis um, and for me nowadays in some of these prop shops um, the failure rate of their new traders for me is, is too high um, I think they've moved away from where they were some prop shops are doing very well particularly in places such as India um, you've got a drive ambition of, of, of the traders is let's face it probably higher than, than, than some of, of our youngsters they have lower living costs so they, as, as traders they have a different profit margin to us that gives them some edge um, they have edge over us because they can live off a, a lower salary um, so there are room for improvement again in prop shops in my, in my opinion from, from the work I've done with them some of them need to go back to basics um, go back to where they were go back to some basic knowledge and, and, and they'll improve from there um, so as we get towards the summary part of the, of, uh, of the webinar the lessons that I've learned over this um, age of trading um, the trading is not a matter of intelligence um, basic trading skills understanding of markets will always be required but it is being lost um, you always tend to think that uh, you know as we move forward and, 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 and evolve that we're always improving but I think some skills can get lost along the way and um, I think the performance of a lot of traders is more erratic than it, than it should be and it could be if we actually learn the real lessons from the, the last 20-30 years banks to me look more like retail traders than ever before which is ironic given the fact of all the um, effort they've put into risk management all of the largest ever losses at banks have come since the introduction of stricter risk management models <clears throat> example the what was known as the well trade which was um, I think it was a credit was a credit default swap trade uh, at JP Morgan where again this is a, a, a smart and inverted commas trader who, who knew better than the rest of the market he knew this trade was 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 a really good trade the rest of the market doubted it actually and there was a lot of talk that this trade wasn't good but this guy um, he had a, a different opinion he was extremely smart you know, in terms of if you look at his academic ability the trade was completely wrong and it lost them uh, in the billions um, and that is one of a number of trades which are highly intelligent people believing they've found edge where no one else sees it there's an arrogance to that which I'm not a big fan of um, and an inability of, of, of of not just those traders to look at themselves and think am I wrong but there's an inability of others to be able to argue with them internally and I've seen this firsthand at investment banks where people other people in the bank think that this trade is wrong and they raise questions but when you're arguing against someone with a PhD in math and you don't have a PhD in math you aren't you are not going to win that argument in the bank so how do you really manage that kind of a, an environment and that's becoming very difficult um, so and this this whale trade is a classic example of that and as I say I've seen it both in my time in investment banks and also during my consulting to investment banks um, and that's why I often get brought in is to, to have that discussion of you know how do you see this trade and where are the risks the real risks um, the risk models will have flaws they're only as good as what what the banks are programmed into them um, and they often miss the riskiest trades which is bizarre because they're supposed to do that but um, they're, they're only as good as what they're programmed um, in terms of the wider areas now misinformation um, in my opinion is now winning the race to educate traders 
both in the retail industry, well, that's always been the case. It's always been the case that there's misinformation in the retail industry. Um, in the real industry, um, that too. So we look at the prop shops, they're now using more charts and technical trading than they were before. It's easy to teach that sort of stuff, but it's not reliable. So a niche still exists for skilled traders. So what does a good trader look like from my experience? Um, so I, to me, a good trader doesn't need to be highly intelligent. doesn't mean he won't be, but he doesn't need to be. Um, but obviously being of low intelligence won't work. You have to have an ability to sense when something isn't right. And, and knowledge of the markets will give you that. This, doesn't, this isn't right. And then you have to have that ability to take action because of it. You must have humility as a trader, the ability to say I'm wrong um, and, and just to get out. You have to be able to think independently and take contrarian trades. You must be able to trade against the market because sometimes the market's wrong and that's when you can make the most money. So just being a trend follower, herd, herd sort of mentality, it's not going to work. Um, you have to be flexible. You have to be able to change your trading when market conditions change because they will change. And if you want to have a 20-year career in the markets, you've got to have the ability to change during that because it will go from a volatile time to a quiet time. You must change your trading in different times. Never stop learning. Markets are always changing. New products are always being developed. You've got to keep on top of it all, trying to learn as much as you can. You have to have the ability to learn from mistakes. That's not just the ability in you as a person, but whatever trading style you're doing has to provide you with the ability to learn from mistakes. So if you're just following a chart pattern and it has a 60% success rate or 50% success rate as they do, normally 50% or less, um, you know, you have a winner, you have a loser, you have a winner, you have a loser. How do you learn from that? How do you find out what's better than the others? In my opinion, you, you, you can't. So I think you need to have a trading style that allows you to learn from when you're wrong to know that that doesn't quite work. Discipline, you must cut losses. I, I'm not a fan of doubling up, averaging down. In my opinion, you have to, you have to cut losses quickly. I'm a strong supporter of that. The competitive edge, you must love winning and hate losing. Um, and that will drive you to only like winning trades. It's one reason, again, like with with this, the scalping that I do, it's about having 80% plus profits. I'm not interested in trading with 50% profits and just using my discipline to get me over the line for a little bit of profit. You know, 50% success rate, win-loss rate to me is, it doesn't mean I know anything about the market. It's a toss of a coin. Um, I want to I wanna win. Um, you have to have an ability to stay calm, uh, particularly for trading things like futures where the markets are moving quickly. You've got to be able to be calm in that environment, not get flustered. Uh, and you need to be able to make objective decisions based on real information. Uh, and that's a whole new topic in itself. Um, but objective decisions, obviously, as it says, objective, not subjective, not based on somebody else's opinion. Or It's, it's exactly you, you can trade what you see. Uh, and that concludes. All right. Thank you very much, Gary. So, guys, if you have questions, go ahead and type them now. So right there at the end, Gary, I found something interesting. You were talking about win rate. Um, it just kind of reminds me that uh, I, I'm not sure how to phrase this. There's, there's, I don't believe there's any single argument that applies to every single circumstance of the market. And the reason I say this is because you said that you're a scalper and you like 80% win rates. I'm not a scalper. I hate scalping. My win rate is is 50 to 60%, but my my risk reward ratio, what I what I win on those trades is far higher than what I lose on the losing trades. Um, so you know we have very different approaches, you and I. Um, I imagine you're successful. I I know that I'm successful. So it just I, I guess my point being is that the, everything is different, right? Some people like to scalp, some people like to swing trade, some people, you know, are in between. Yeah, no, I. I don't have a don't question that at all. Right, um, but there, I, I guess, yeah, I, I I get myself a little bit of trouble whenever I uh, talk about these things, so I I won't go into to detail. But I guess the important thing, I guess my point is that you should find an approach that works for you. Would you would you agree with that? That 
Uh, I mean, people that are watching this webinar, they can find things that resonate with them, things that they like, things they feel comfortable with, and they should go research them, prove them on their own. And then if they repeat this with other material, other books, other methodologies, you know, other things that they read and learn about, my, my advice has always been to not believe it until you prove it yourself and to really fully understand it and, and make it your own. Uh, would you agree with that, or do you have a different take on it? No, I, I do. Um, my my personal belief that I, I want to aim for for a higher success rate, and that's not just with scalping; it's with position trading as well. is is also about um, and with with the retail market, um, the idea of um, that if people for you, it, it works great because you've got good discipline of uh, of going, you know, 50, 60 percent success, and, and and then cutting losses, running winners. That that's great. Um, for a lot of retail traders, in particular, um, we start to introduce the idea of random rewards, where they have some winners, they have some losers, they have some winners, some losers, and, and we know that psychologically, random rewards become addictive. If you're not sure when you're going to have a winner or a loser, but you know they pop up from time to time. They can become addictive, um, and I think it's obviously very important that people don't become addicted to trading. Um, so one of the things I say is, if you aim for higher win rates, you don't become addicted. Um, but some traders who have, you know, 50% success rate means that they do have winners and losers, and uh, and for, for some retail traders who don't have that discipline that you do, um, they will run into some problems. Right. I, I I enjoyed the discussion, so I hope you don't mind. I I, I have a counter counterpoint for the the people that like scalping, uh, and the eighty percent win rate. That has the same attraction to the point to where I believe those people become literally afraid of risk, and we want to minimize risk but not eliminate risk. You know, so people that are afraid of risk literally don't take the necessary risk that they need. And what I've seen on the forum and in the, in the, in the form of journals over the years, people, um, like a, a very common example is say someone wants to trade long, okay? So they go long, then they have this really tiny stop because they're afraid of a big stop and they, they get taken out. And then they're back in again and do it again. And they're back in again and do it again. And uh, there's lots of things wrong with this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that, that that uh, it's simple, but I, I guess um, there's arguments on, on all sides. Okay, I'll, I'll shut up. I don't. I, I get myself, like I said, I get myself in trouble. A lot of people don't like it when I talk um, about uh, scalping. Okay, Mike S has a question. He says, "Is it possible for pro traders to somehow see or tell who they're trading against? If so, how?" Um. In t a lot of the, the banks are actually trading directly with um, funds, hedge funds, pension funds, those kind of things. So in, in that side of the, the ledger, yes, they know who they're trading against. Um, in terms of when they execute into uh, into the market, if they do that, um, then usually no. Um, but if, a, if an investment bank desk is working perfectly, what will happen is that you'll, you'll just end up Buying from one fund and selling to another. That that's how. If a desk is run perfectly, you've got the sales force that can do that. You buy it from one, you just sell to another, and it doesn't even hit the market. That that and, and of course in that situation, you know who's bought and who's sold. Right. And you're keeping track of that, of course, all the time. And and one of the, of course, the key um, uh, edge that, that the best banks have is that they know where all the business is. Right. Who's got what? I, I don't believe that you mentioned uh, dark pools in your presentation, yeah. but that's that's kind of a whole other thing, right? So, yeah. um, some people. This is a question of my own. Some people refer to uh, a type of data feed or an order feed as level three, which is the ability to see the entire book, not just say ten levels, for example. Do you do you have any experience with this? Is this a myth? Um, personally, no, I haven't seen, I haven't had experience of it. But we're looking more, um, as I say, equities and futures with with those things. Um, banks are generally not trading futures in that kind of a way. Um, in terms of uh, equity um, and, and selling into the equity market, 
Um, it, it, is it possible? Of course, it's possible that, that, that people are, are doing that. But as I say, that the, the number one goal of, of, a, of a bank desk is really to, to, to buy from one and sell to another, not even hit the market. Um, the guys that are trying to trade in and out and who's, who would probably get the most advantage from that are really the high frequency firms, which is a whole different realm in itself. Um, they, they probably get more edge from that. Um, okay, George is asking if you use a dome. Do you trade with a, a, a dome like a... Yes, uh, when scalping, yes. Okay. I figured you would. <laughs> Richard, uh, Richard says, can you please summarize how a trader makes a market? Makes them. So making a market means to effectively to make the price. So uh, we'll take a simple product like an equity um, and uh, you've got a stock trading at you know, maybe the, the bid and offer on the screen that everybody sees might be a uh, dollar fifty on the bid and a dollar fifty two on the offer, and that might be the bid offer. Um, but a market maker, so we might get rung up by a fund who wants to sell half a million shares. Uh, you know, and so you're going to have to make a price. And the bid might be for for twenty thousand. The bid below at one forty nine might be for a hundred thousand. The bid at one forty eight might be for a hundred thousand. And, and so forth. Now, the, the job of a market maker to, to be able to make the price is to say, okay, he wants to sell 500,000, what price do I have to make? Where do I think I can get 500,000 away? And, and, and to give a clue, if, if the bid's 150 and the offer's at 152, you can't make a bid of like 147 or 148. That, that won't be taken in this competitive environment. So um, you have to have an understanding of of where you think you can get that away, where's the business taking place, where do you think you can get it away. In fact, often there, there is a, a very much comp competition in, in banks between salesmen and traders. Um, salesmen just want to do as many trades as they can for their clients, traders obviously just want to make money. So often, in fact usually, salesmen don't tell the traders what the client wants to do. So as a trader, you might get asked, I want a two-way price on, on, on that stock in half a million shares, so much bigger than the market size. Um, the salesman often knows which way the client is, but he just he doesn't want to tell you that um, um, because he wants to just get the trade done. He might get extra commission for that or whatever. So your job as a market maker is to be able to make a two-way price, at least certainly no bigger than the spread in the market, 150 at 152. You might have to make it inside, but where you can happily trade on both sides in a size that's much bigger. Right. So obviously by 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 definition, by doing that, you have to have a really good understanding of where exactly this thing is trading at this moment. Right. Jeff is asking a question that I was actually wondering about myself. He says uh, there's a lot of – basically, there's a lot of uh, floor traders or ex-pit traders that when they transitioned to screen trading, they, they didn't do so well. Um, how is it that uh, you were able to cope or succeed? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, uh, there's a couple of things. It's obviously, uh, there is some luck in there. The luck for me was that when the markets, actually that actual point of transitioning when the floor closed down and, and went onto screens, uh, actually coincided with um, the, the the birth of my of my first child. Um, so I took a few months off. I think I took at least two months off. So I, I, I to to be with uh, with my wife and him. Um, and actually, when I got back, a lot, a lot of the damage had already been done. Uh, and at that point, I didn't know whether I was going to trade options or futures. I decided futures. I was fortunate because um, a guy that I was I worked closely with on the floor, um, uh, who's who's uh, American, um, and he is the best trader I've ever worked with. He also moved from options to futures, and and he he led me in the right direction. He you know he explained to me what he'd seen so far, and for many of those traders, and I've I've written this in. in at least one of my books. For many of those traders who transitioned, they struggled because they couldn't see what they used to see uh, in the pit. And the the original, if you go back to the original platforms being used, that many of them went onto, they were, you know, compared to what we see today, they were really poor. Um, their ability to, to to see what's happening, you know, time and sales, even these things didn't didn't exist on these platforms. Um, so what many of them did, they um, they went and 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 uh, got charting software. And had a, their screen with their charts up, and and they really just became like the guys they've been trading against for ten years. They became just like another retail trader trading off a chart. Um, what I was fortunate because this guy, um, you know, he explained that to me. He explained to me the benefits of getting the best 
platform. So I immediately went out and got, um, you know, what was by far a more expensive platform. It was significantly more expensive than the others. It cost me a thousand pounds sterling a month in those days for the platform. But he said, this is worth it. Whereas all the other guys went for the cheap platforms. Um, he told me to go to a clearer that had much better servers where they weren't putting a hundred guys on one. So I did that. That cost me another thousand pounds a month um, to, to sit in that room. Um, so I was fortunate that I had a really good, a really good teacher who, who told me the things that were going to be important to me. Um, and then he showed me the, how, how to scale futures. He, he showed me some techniques. Um, from there, I've had to evolve them myself. But he, he showed me the basics of, of how to scale. So um, again, the benefits of being able to learn from a real person, from a, a real trader who had seen people fail understood how they failed and also worked things out. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm indebted to him. Great. Um, are you talking about uh, TT's X Trader or w which platform do you use these yeah, days? It's TT. It? Yeah. All right. TT has always been the best. I've, um, you know, moved from time to time and, and there's some now that I think there's a, it's the, the difference between TT and others now is a lot narrower than it was back then. Much narrower. But you still use X Trader today, or or no? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you you mentioned writing books. I have a question of my own. Uh, I've seen there's a there's a common um, axiom, if you will, out in the marketplace that basically says that that uh, the traders that write books don't know how to trade. Instead, they write books because that's how they earn their living. And I, I have a feeling that you'd like to comment on that. I've talked to many authors over the years. Uh, what, what do you have to say about that? Uh, I can tell you I certainly don't earn a living from writing books. Um, there's, there's no, well, for me, there's very little money in writing books. So I explain that the, 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 the two books are different. So neither book is a how-to trade book, firstly. So, and it comes back to, 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 to what I'm here and what I'm doing. Um, none of this was planned when I moved to Australia. Um, my plan was to, to sort of chill out, I suppose, and do other things. Um, firstly, though, I was asked by a few investment banks to do some consulting work, so I kept doing it. What then happened was I read uh, a trading magazine here aimed at retail traders. Um, it was the first time I'd ever read a trading magazine. I'd, I'd never read a trading book or magazine ever in my time in in, in London, um, there's just no need. And I and I read this book, and what I read was so different to what I'd seen in the markets that I, I was just appalled by it. So I wrote to the magazine and said, "Look, oh, this is my history. Uh, I've worked in the bank. I'd like to, to, to write for you." And they said, "No, thanks. We're, we're not interested." So fair enough. Um, I then went to some seminars run by these guys who were so-called star traders, and, and again, what I heard was just ridiculous. And, and it was all based on, on technical analysis and, and moving averages and this kind of stuff. And I can safely say that in my time in the city, we'd never used any of it. None of the trading desks I'd ever worked at had ever used any of this technical stuff. So I decided, you know, I, I wanted to write something to try and help retail traders. Um, so I spent two years researching technical analysis, um, taking studies from universities all around the world and, and other people, um, using my experience and, and putting that together, and that was the first book. So the first book is a look at technical analysis. Does it work? You know, for the most people that use it, why would it be flawed and that kind of stuff? Um, and I did that really because there's so much stuff in academia that doesn't get out into the retail space. Um, and I wanted to take on those guys. I wanted to take on, and I realized if it's just what Gary Norton says is no one's going to believe anything. But if it's, well, the US Federal Reserve have published this about head and shoulders patterns and so-and-so and so-and-so and so has said this, the London School of Economics have done this, then maybe people would listen a little bit. So it was really to take on um, those guys. And, and it's the same with the new book. Right. So the new book, uh, An End to the Bull, the bull, not, it's not about an end to the bull market, it's an end to the, the BS. It's Trying to tell people this is what the industry wants you to believe, right? And this is what, and this is what you need to know. So, I'm, you know, in, in that sense, you know, I don't make a lot of friends in this business. Have Have you ever say. Have you ever read a book um, titled "Evidence Based Technical Analysis" by David Aronson? No, I haven't. You might check it out. I think you might like it. It's It's one of the books that I 
recommend. It sounds pretty similar to yours. I haven't read yours, unfortunately. Okay, Hawk is asking, um, can you comment on what Dodd Frank basically means for the for the current marketplace and prop trading? Sorry, who said that again? Hawk uh, in the in the room is asking if you can comment on the the U.S. regulation Dodd Frank and how it affects prop trading businesses today. Dog Frank. <laughs> Dodd Frank. This might be outside your realm. This is a U.S. thing. Okay, okay. we'll skip. Maybe. Uh, Victor is asking if you can talk about how flow trading differs from floor trading. So today, you know, well, you know, because uh, Pete with Jigsaw Trading, who's sponsored the, the webinar, yeah. he, he focuses, his applications are focused on order flow. So um, any comment yeah. on the importance of, of order flow? Yeah, it, it's, it's very important to all short-term traders. Um, to, to follow, and I, if you go back to what I said before about, um, you know, when you're making a price in, in large size, you need to know exactly where the order flow is. Where can I get this away uh, if I'm long? Where could I cover it back if I'm short? Um, and a trader really needs to know at all times, you know, where, where if I get long, can I, can I sell? And where if I'm short, can I buy it back? Uh, and that's where it's more than just about understanding the, the price. Um, you have to understand the activity on that price as well. So following the order flow, following what where, what, where, what the market's doing, sorry, is, is really important. Right. Um, Jim is asking if you can talk about methodologies that institutions use. Now, you've mentioned that they don't, they don't use charts and so forth. Um, I, I guess maybe a better way to phrase it, and he's asking this as well, is like start, start us off by just defining what a typical time frame is for an institutional trade. Is it seconds, minutes, days, weeks, months? Yeah, so there's there's two aspects to it. There's the market making side, and there's the position taking side. And and as I said in the in the presentation, from time to time they intermingle. I mean, even the market makers will keep positions. The market, if if banks have structured their desk correctly, they'll be doing more market making than position taking. Um, so really, market making, if if it's done properly, it's within a day. So you know. One fund will want to sell 500,000 shares to you. You want to get them placed out that day, and if possible, as quickly as possible, because obviously the price of that particular stock can move. So, if you've got the, the desk working well, you'll you'll be in and out of a trade quite quickly. In terms of positions, yes, the, the, because you're a market maker, you will end up with with positions, um, but also the bank itself will want to take positions. Um, really, how how long? It can be weeks. Um, on the proprietary book, so that this what we often call the back book in, in a bank. So the the traders that take longer term positions, they will be for months. Um, okay. But the, on the front book, so your front book, on the front book, they'll, you'll try to turn the market making side over as quickly as possible. So again, flow trading, just get in and out of the flow, trying to take small amounts, and often, and then they'll have other positions that they'll trade around, and and really that's that's looked at on a on a weekly basis, I would I would say. Okay. James is, is asking about methods that have stood the test of time. Um, you know, tape reading now called order flow uh, is obviously popular, but, you know, let, let me just adapt James' question a little bit. He's asking about Wyckoff volume spread analysis, but let me throw out some other things like, you know, Fibonacci's and so forth. What, what, what do you see these things having a place uh, in the market? Yeah, I mean, personally, on, on Fibonacci levels, that kind of stuff, I, I don't think they have any place. Uh, I, I just That's a subjective form of analysis, and I believe traders should aim for objective analysis. So just look at what's happening. What's happening? What's trading at what price in, in what way? And, and also not to just look at one market is important as well, to be looking at a range of different markets. To understand that one market only shows you one set of participants' view at that time. If you understand, want to understand uh, better what's happening in, in the world in general, you need to look at different different contracts, different different assets at the same time. Will give you a different view, and that might give you a heads up that there's something different going on. Um, but my view of trading is you've got to be as objective as possible. Just look at what's happening. Right. Don't overlay other people's opinions. Just look at what's happening and trade it. Right. Um, in the same way, and that's why I suppose I, I do aim more towards 
the flow trading, scalping, and what I call bookmaking. And if you look at, you know, I always say to people, if you want to become successful in the horse racing industry, you want a career in the horse racing industry, what job will you be? You'll be a bookmaker. But you don't see books about how to become a bookmaker. Everyone wants to be a punter because they think that that's where they'll make the most money. But the reality is that most punters will lose and only a small number of them will make money. Bookmakers don't try to predict who wins the race, they just try to manage their risk of the race. And they look at where the flow of money is, even if they think horse number five is, 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 is completely useless, they'll only keep laying horse number five to a certain degree. And then they get to a point where they go, well, whatever we think about this now, other people think differently, so we have to act. Um, so I, I think that you've got to, you've got to trade what, what's out there, not what, what somebody overlays on top of it. Sure. Very good. Uh, Paco is asking about if you could basically name the disadvantages of institutions and the advantages of retail. Like, what uh, what can a nimble retail trader do that gives them an advantage? Yeah, I, I think uh, when I made the point that I think that institutional institutions and banks have become more like retail traders, I think that's a, your, your question really excuse me, follows on really well from there in that I think if retail traders can get their act together, they're in a better spot now than they've been for a long time. Um, and we can talk about the discussion of, you know, delay data or do some HFTs get data quick and that kind of stuff. But in terms of your ability to access markets, particularly futures markets, which I do think futures markets are a pretty transparent and, and, and honest market, um, I think you can access it really well with good systems. Uh, I think you, you can be more nimble with them than them. Uh, and as I say, I think if you can understand just the pricing of it and, and, and what's happening and what's that order flow and, 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 and et cetera, I think you, you, you can be on a, on a reasonable playing field with them. Um, I don't think they have significant edge over you uh, in that way. Their edge over you in a market like futures is simply their ability to hold losses. Um, that's really what it is. Um, and maybe you know, seeing the flow of business from other desks on the bank they might have a quick heads up of something that's happening in, in the markets in general. Um, but I, th I think retail traders, if, if, you can get, if they get their act together, are in a better spot now than they were relative to investment banks 15 years ago. And, and that might go against what people think. They might think that the banks uh, you know, have got it all their own way. But if you go back 15, 20 years, the banks had all the information and only released little bits of it. Um, uh, so I, and I think that they're trading their, their knowledge of the skills of their traders I believe has diminished. It's kind of interesting because because now you see some uh, some uh, prop shops that are scouring social media sites uh, and you know monitoring hundreds of thousands of Twitter feeds to try to find an edge uh, for a particular equity or, or so forth in a split second. Okay, so that kind of leads into another question here. Uh, Lucas is asking, what do you think about algorithmic trading? Do you trade any uh, any algo trading yourself? And how can humans compete? Okay, again, excellent question. Uh, I don't personally algo trade. Um, but um, I, I said I, I learned uh, about scalping from a guy who's the best trader I've ever known. He, he is an algo trader now, um, so I don't doubt that, um, that that you know the best algo traders will do well. But it's like everything that the best ones will, and and lots of them don't. And um, to generalise about any type of trade is dangerous. So you know um, the thing about this guy is he he he's very smart. He's an engineering background, but his understanding of markets and how they work is exceptional. And so even when he's programming in his, his algorithms, there's not just a look at this from a basis of this is just numbers and I'm looking for some sort of pattern in the numbers. He understands because he was a floor trader as well, he understands how markets work. So he can sift through that in a different way to a normal, in inverted commas, quant type person who might be putting in an algorithm. And I think the danger with um, some algorithm traders is that they just use it as if it's math, the markets are just math and they go through the numbers and, and, and they will sometimes come out with the wrong answers. Um, so the best algo traders will do well. Um, right. Does that mean other traders can't? No, because they're trading a different type of different uh, different way to us. And yeah, I mean, the, with the scalping that I try and do, I'm only trying to trade against the little guy, right. the one lot, two lot type of traders. Algorithmic traders are really trying to find where the big guys are 
uh, well, I'm trying to avoid the big guys, so I, they, I try not to meet them. Okay, let me let me rephrase Martin's question just slightly. I, I see a lot of people that basically blame algo trading for their losses. You know, it's because a a yes. bot you know ran stops or that type of mentality or thinking. Uh, the markets have changed; it's impossible to compete. Any comment on that angle? Yeah, I, I've heard those comments my whole life. Um, the floors, you know, on the, it used to be floor trading. The traders in banks hated the locals on the floors. Oh, they run the stops. They take us out. They do this, they do that. No, no, they don't. They're trading one lots and two lots in a pit. Um, yeah, everybody's always got an excuse for when things go wrong. Um, again, my view is as a trader, when things go wrong, there's only one person's fault. Right. And that's yours. Yep. Um, Absolutely. And so, no, I, there's always someone to blame. This year, it's the HFT. I've written a couple of blogs on that. Yep. Um, don't blame them. They're doing what our market does. Um, someone they come in, they try to make a little bit of edge, and again, it's not like they're all making money. There's a number of them that, that, that lose money. So, do we do we want to attack them as well? Right. Uh, okay. Um, there's a question from uh, from Martin saying, uh, "What well, we talked we talked about Wyckoff and volume spread analysis and Fibonacci's and so forth. Let's throw a few more out there that are popular: volume profile, market profile." Footprint charts, delta charts, cumulative delta. Any any of these? Any comment on any of these approaches? Uh, look, I, th I think it. <clears throat> how, how do I say this? It, look, it can depend on on your time frame. Okay. Um, for 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 me, scalping in, in in and out in a few seconds, not important. Um, what I'm looking at is just purely what's uh, you know what's trading the, the order flow, um, volume analysis can be important, has to be used correctly though. You have to understand how the volume is created. Um, so just to know that um, this particular price has traded 5,000 contracts. Uh, for me, I'd actually want to see how those 5,000 traded. And that's why one of the things I say with short-term traders is to watch the market trade by trade. Because that's how markets work, trade by trade. So a lot of traders, if you're using charts, will watch the market minute by minute or you know five minute graph but markets don't work like that they're order by order trade by trade um, and in my opinion you don't see what's really happening when you look at a chart so I think when you're looking at any type of analysis you have to say to yourself is this analysis actually looking at the market as it took place um, and that because that's when we get back to the objectivity to be able to look at the market the price the volume any data and to see it as it really took place um, that's what's important to me. Um, so a lot of those indicators, frankly, no, I don't. I, I don't use indicators. I just want to see what's happening. And if I don't, and if I want to see like yesterday's action, I have to know that anything I do in looking at a chart or even time and sales of yesterday's business is not going to be that robust. I'm going to be making a number of assumptions when I'm looking through that. I have to know that. Okay. All right. So, uh, so Gary, we're at 90 minutes. Um, there's still several more questions, so let me ask you this: Is there is there some type of way that people that uh, still have questions or that are going to watch this recording later, is there a way for them to get those questions to you? Yeah, sure. Uh, always happy to answer questions. Uh, they can email me, um, Gary at organicfinancialgroup.com. One R in Gary. Okay. And second question, uh, someone's asking, or a few people are asking, if you can repeat the names of your books. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the newest one is an end to the ball. And the previous one, the one that studies technical analysis, is technical analysis and the active trader. Okay, very good. All right, so guys, since we're at 90 minutes, I'll stop here. Uh, you can email Gary with uh, any other follow-up questions. And I also want to thank Peter Davies from Jigsaw Trading. He's the one that uh, introduced Gary to the forum, and we have him to thank for today's webinar. So thank you very much, Gary. really appreciate your time and apologize for the technical, technical glitch about halfway through, but I think it was a good webinar, and I hope the recording turns out well. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right, thanks, guys. See you later. Bye.